namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa When we approach the Buddha's teaching of anatta, not self, often uh, we um, attempt to understand it intellectually and philosophically, and there may be some benefit in that as a background, as an understanding, but we only really gain an understanding and an appreciation of the value and the the power of this teaching when we start to make it an experience. We start to um, investigate things through that lens. We can begin by um, looking at the teaching the Buddha gave in the Anattalakana Sutta, where he talked about the different ways in which we create a, a illusion of a self. And it turns out there's actually 20 different ways that beings can create a self. Any of the five aggregates can be identified with it as a self body, feelings, perceptions, consciousness, mental formations. And any of them can be identified with in one of four ways. Either the person thinks to take the the body, for example, this applies to all five. This is how we get 20, four times five. It's a, I am the body or the body belongs to me, or I am in the body, or the body is in me. All these 20 ways of regarding the self are actual experiences of people, of beings. Um, Identify a self-reference point, either with the body or consciousness, feelings, perceptions, mental formations. And in some cases, it becomes elaborated into a whole doctrine or theory based on on that. But in many cases, it's just implicit. It's just kind of taken for granted or assumed without being examined. So there's a very convenient shorthand for this, this teaching. It's the simple phrase, not me, not mine. And that simple phrase, that simple uh, handle or entry point into understanding can be applied to any of the aggregates in any situation. And this is how we really gain an understanding of of not-self, of anatta, is not not as an overarching philosophical view, but moment by moment, case by case, we we look at any phenomena of body or mind and regard it as not me, not mine. When we do that, we can find that it's very refreshing and liberating. Uh, This concept of a self is very uh, constricting and um, it's like being in a a little prison and abandoning the idea of self, one is set free. One of the benefits of uh, not taking a self view is the elimination of fear. The arahant is said to be completely fearless. 
And the more you abandon the idea of a self-reference point, the less fear you have. You know, any kind of fear, whether it's a you know fear of physical harm or uh, anxiety, social anxiety, or uh, nervousness, dealing with with uh, people or situations, these are all based on on a self view. Because when there's the idea of a self, then the self is something that needs to be protected. And when that's abandoned, then there's a great openness and emptiness. And you can just do what needs to be done. And no, uh, no um, hindrance of, uh, of fear or anxiety that, that cripples the mind and prevents wise action. You know, occurs, which is certainly not to say that one would run headfirst into danger. You'd be able to then rationally assess the situation and deal with it without being falling into to fear, which is an ignorance-based mind state, primarily based on the illusion of a self. This not me, not mine can be applied as a practical measure in, uh, to any kind of uh, turmoil or mental distress that arises. You look at what's going on and regard it not me, not mine. You don't take ownership of it. For example, uh, with uh, the hindrance of anger. When anger arises in the mind, if you regard it as I am angry, then you become fixed in that position. But if you see it as a, a mental process objectively and say here is anger, this is anger, you already weaken it, diminish it, because you're not taking ownership of it. You're seeing it as an objective phenomenon and uh, a lot not feeding it not taking ownership of it it's even uh, very useful with the physical pain you know if you uh, say you step on a sharp object and you hurt your foot and if you kind of and then they're going to suffer there's pain physical pain is a is then a given quality, it's a sensation. But on top of the physical pain, a lot of the suffering comes from mental reaction, a kind of whinging attitude. You know, poor me, why did my foot hurt? Oh, my poor foot. But if you are able to just regard it, not as my foot hurts, but just there is pain, here is pain then, you know, the pain is still there, but you're not taking ownership of it. So the, uh, the mental suffering then is not present. With um, often uh, people are become torment themselves quite unnecessarily with uh, uh, running off into the past and future. People dredge up old painful memories and it's like, like uh, playing with a sore tooth with your tongue. You just keep going back and back to it. You know, uh, some painful old memory. But if you're able to regard that, it's not me, not mine. That's something that happened long ago. It's not real now. I don't take ownership of it. And since there's no continuity of self, it's not, it's that condition of uh, phenomena where this happened, that no longer exists. No, it's not me, it's not mine. It's just something that happened. Likewise, running off into the future, we run off into the future with um, either uh, 
hope and dreams or uh, very often with fears and anxieties about things that might happen. Anything in the future is not real. It hasn't manifested yet. So it's pointless to, even if it's some terrible thing is going to happen, you know, it's going to happen once. And why run it uh, beforehand? Go over it again and again. There's a old saying that uh, the brave man dies but once, the coward dies many times. Mm -hmm. Now, there might be a, um, a, a temptation to to see the mind or, or consciousness as a self. But there's no, uh, no validity to that either. There's the knowing, but there's no one doing the knowing. It's just a process. You can't pin down a... Uh, an actor, a knower. No, this is only a, a mental construct that has no reality, that doesn't exist. And this is the way to regard the knowing, just as, as a process. A problem that arises here, I think a conceptual problem, is because the nature of language, and it doesn't matter whether it's English or Pali or uh, Greek or anything, when we talk about the mind and consciousness and so forth, we're forced by the nature of language to use nouns. So this kind of creates a, when we say consciousness or chitta in Pali, see, this uh, can create a false sense that there's something we're talking about, there's something where it's, re it's really an, a name of a process, not knowing. And it's immaterial, insubstantial. There's nothing, uh, there's no such thing as a, as, a, as a mind or a chitta. But there is the process of knowing, the process of, of um, there isn't even a proper verb for it, but, you know, just to say the, for the mind, minding, The idea of a self arises from the a kind of mental habit or a shorthand of, of organizing experience around a, a reference point. And from a um, conventional or functional point of view, it can you know it has some uh, use, you know, it, it's the way we sort out the uh, uh, the universe. But when it's taken to be a metaphysical reality, is when the uh, the problem begins. And it's not just a question of um, philosophical error. It's a it's a question of identifying one of the main root causes of our suffering of why we experience suffering, why we're, we have unhappiness and pain and anxiety. It's because of, a, of having this self-view, this self-reference point. It's not easy to let go of because it's so ingrained. But it's the practice to be working towards experiential understanding of it. Another way the Buddha talked about uh, understanding self was to negate the idea of a self in any of the aggregates. And this is particularly referencing the, the way the Indians thought about self, but it was still, still a valid uh, point of view today. 
the self was conceived by the Indians, the Atman, as uh, unchanging, imperishable, you know, the essence of a person. And the Buddha said, you know, well, is body the self? And there's some who would say that it is. But if the body is self, then um, that which is belongs to me, that which is mine, that which I am, I should have con complete control over it. So I, I should wish, may I be taller, may I be shorter, may I be thinner, may I be fatter. And all, you know, it would just come to pass. We could just, this is me, this is mine, I can do what I want with it. And also the, the body comes to uh, change outside of our control. We can be prone to, to illness, we fall uh, under the, the domain of aging. All these things are, are changes in the body that we don't control. It's not, uh, if, 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 it, if it was the true self, it would be unchanging. And the same goes with all the other aggregates. Now the feelings constantly change. And we don't really control the feelings. You can't really control feeling pleasant, pleasant or unpleasant, happy or sad. Perception. Constant, constant shifting of perceptions. Mental formations. Some people might identify mental formations as a self. And this is uh, like, for example, René Descartes, I think, therefore I am. It's kind of an identification of thinking with a self. But thinking is just another process. And when we, when we meditate, we can see, and I, th I think everybody who tries to meditate can see that um, it's very difficult to actually control the thinking process. And we've already spoken about uh, consciousness. Another point the Buddha made about consciousness is uh, identified as a self. He said that some people identify the body as a self and some people identify consciousness as a self. And to identify consciousness as, as a self is 16 times more foolish than to identify the body as a self. And uh, the reason for that is because consciousness changes 16 times faster than than the body it's constantly changing that's kind of an just as a sort of footnote that, that is an interesting passage that he uses that number 16 because it references a teaching in abhidhamma that um, consciousness moments uh, it takes 16 consciousness moments to perform one act of cognition and during that time a single physical dhamma can rise and fall so that the, according to the abhidhamma theory of how dhammas uh, manifest the mental ones are 16 times there's 16 mental ones for every single physical one At each moment, consciousness is taking taking an object. So the whole essence of consciousness is, is really defined. It's defined by the objects it takes. So it's constantly changing. You know, there's a the Zen uh, story or koan about the searching for the owner of the empty house and not finding him. But then who is doing the searching? Now, if you're trying to look at the nature of the nature of uh, mind or consciousness, it becomes like a house of mirrors, it becomes an infinite regress. Consciousness no is just pure knowing. So it can't know itself because it's purely subjective. 
an analogy would be that you can't see your own face. You can never see your own face. You can see it, a, a photograph of your face, or you can see a reflection of your face in the mirror, but you can't see your own face. This is a, an, an analogy to consciousness can't turn in on itself. Looking at consciousness, you just looking at concepts about consciousness. So now we're getting close to the uh, Thai forest uh, teaching about the chitta and the practice of centering oneself in the chitta, the, the true heart, the true home. It's important with those teachings not to turn the, the chitta into some kind of a self. That's not the intention of, of the teaching. And that's not the that's not the nature of the chitta. But relying on that uh, pure knowing is very liberating because because of the great simplicity of that aspect of mind. It's really the the most fundamental aspect of mind is just the, the fact of being conscious. There's no complication there. This is really why people have some difficulty grasping the nature of consciousness. Is not because it's complicated, but because it's it's too simple. It's so simple it's hard to grasp. There's no if it would be easier to understand if we could explain it with a algorithm, if we could have a step by step analysis of how consciousness works, but we can't just does its thing, it just knows, and that's all there is to it. And really, if we're truly centered in the citta, there is no place there for a self. And if we add a self to it, if we identify citta as self, then we're not, we're not understanding citta, we're outside of citta, we're now experiencing a concept or a construct that we've created. There's a sense in which we could say that Chitta is, was never born and never dies. It just It's just a momentary experience. So really the way to to approach this uh, teaching of not-self in a broad philosophical way, you know, we can talk about it and the, there's different approaches. There's the um, uh, dependent origination which teaches us that nothing arises without cause and condition. So nothing exists independently no independent existence of anything. Everything is a, in relationship, in a matrix. We can look at it through the lens of Abhidhamma by analyzing things down to the fine grain and not finding a, a self anywhere. In the Indian philosophical language, it's, uh, there, there's no svabhava. There's no own essence. Things have uh, in the in um, in both in India and also in uh, in Greek thought there was the idea that um, things had an essence and associated with the essence were qualities. Qualities would modify the the essence, you know, and would be things like color and smell and so on. But the essence was thought to be unchangeable, imperishable, and so on, the true heart of anything. Whereas the Buddha said, no, that there's no such thing. There's the qualities, there's redness, but there's no actual red. There's only the experience of red. One way this is uh, 
expressed as nothing exists from his own side. So these kind, there, there are, and there are, this doesn't exhaust the possibilities of looking at not self from a philosophical point of view. And that that's that that's actually has some some merit, some use, but really to as I said at the outset, to gain a real entry into this teaching, you have to make it a lived experience. You have to take it uh, on a case by case basis. Whatever you kind of. Uh, identifying at this moment as me or mine you know look at it and see it's not me it's not mine try and find a me or a mine and you don't really find it and applying this as a uh, as a practical reflection with in problematic situations when the mind is is causing you uh, suffering in one way or the other you look at that mental state and look at the causes of that mental state and regard them as this is not me, this is not mine. Recall too the, the Buddha's words to a Mogaraja, a Brahmin student who Ask the Buddha, how can I escape from the gaze of the Lord of Death? And the Buddha's answer was in three terms. Be ever mindful, Mogaraja, point one, starting point. Be mindful, have sati, have this uh, recollection of you know, what's going on, where you are, what you're doing. And the second point, see the world as empty. So don't, don't see substance, you know, see process. See the world as empty, so externally see the world as empty. And the third term was abandon thoughts of self. So internally see the emptiness. Now empty inside, empty outside. There's an old riddle. How do you fill a sieve with seawater? And the answer is you throw it into the ocean. Okay, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Sadhu Guru Ram Dada 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 S